Some like it out of any hall. Uh, you know, there's two. You know, there's several different kinds of comedies. What you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, where the where the timing is everything. There's that pitter patter. Mm -hmm. Doctor Strange love my favorite comedy. I don't know if it's the greatest one, but my favorite is a satire. Yeah. And it is just real. Peter Sellers is in that too. Peter Sellers is one of the greatest comic actors in the history of film. Maybe yeah. you know, and uh, he may be the greatest comic actor ever. And uh, uh, Annie Hall is you know great in terms of these are. Fantastic comedies, uh, just the greatest ever. In terms of uh, dramas, wow! I mean, obviously you got to start with The Godfather. A citizen, has everybody seen Citizen Kane? Everybody, everybody. good. Must see, must see. What I suggest is you watch it again and again and again and again and again. I've seen The Godfather at least a hundred times. Yep. Maybe more. Yeah. And Godfather Part Two, I've probably seen fifty times. It's like going to film school. Yeah. It really is. I was talking to, was this a, a couple of days ago about, uh, you know, a table read about, um, you know, because this guy was going to kill someone in the script. And I said, you just have to come up and kill him. Don't do that. If you remember The Godfather Part Two, you know Robert De Niro had the gun and he was going to kill that mafioso. You know, the guy in the white hat and would steal money from everybody. He didn't just have Robert De Niro walk up to him and shoot him. What did he do? He had Robert De Niro go up there and you know, kind of wait and stealth, do some preparation, and it's all building, yeah, right? Yeah. And then this little bit at the end that Francis did, and Singleton, and I had already seen the movie 30 times, Singleton, go back and watch it again, and look at the, look how he killed him. The, the mafioso walks up the steps. Now, a lesser filmmaker would have had Robert De Niro jump out and shoot him on the steps. Right. Melodramatic. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't have done that. That's not good filmmaking. Mm -hmm. The mafioso comes up the steps, and then the light is out. So he yes, taps yes, the yes, light, yes, the yes, light goes yes. off and on, right. and then you see Robert De Niro and he shoots him. Yeah. It's a master filmmaker, yeah, for sure. just taking that one little beat before the violence. So you're full of all this anticipation. That's why I say, you gotta watch, and I already seen the movie yeah. at least 30 times. Single said, go back and watch it again. Yeah. And so you study these movies, you know, the Citizen Kane's, the, uh, the Godfather, you know, part one and two. Uh, Patton also is one of my favorite if you want to watch a biography. And a biography should be not about what happened, but why. Here you go. In the case of uh, Patton, he envisioned himself as a reincarnation of a Roman general. It's all through the movie. He talked about it. He said, I was here before. I was here. I was a Roman general. Wow. He's, is he crazy? Maybe. You know, but it, it informed him. And uh, my favorite biography of all time, though, is uh, Amadeus. I've seen Amadeus 50 times. I mean, anybody seen Amadeus? You can't do better than that. You just, you cannot do better than that. You know, again, a lesser filmmaker, writer, would have said, okay, Mozart, he's a, a child genius, and we're going to make a movie about this enfant terrible from his point of view. Nothing could be less interesting. What did they do with Amadeus? They made it from Salieri's point of view, looking at this child genius with envy and jealousy. What a brilliant way to pre pre uh, pre uh, present a biography. I mean, it's just, just genius. I even said, and I said this in a couple of film forums, if I were a writer starting out now, I'd write about Mozart's sister. Mozart had a sister who was arguably as brilliant as he was. She's two years older than him. And it's said, it's theorized, hypothesized, that she even wrote some of those scores. And they exchanged these wonderful letters. They loved each other dearly, but there was no room for a woman in those days being a composer. And composers were like NFL or NBA players. They were rock stars. And what could have been with Mozart's sister? See, that would be a great way. Yeah. That would be a great story to tell. You want to, you know, angle in from, some, you know, someplace different. Um, let me see, are there any other movies that jump out? In terms of a romance, hmm, some people say love story. I didn't, you know, not, not for me. Sayonara is a great romance with Marlon Brando. It's great, just wonderful. Red Buttons won an Oscar for a comic actor, won uh, an Oscar for a dramatic role. <coughs> and also On the Waterfront, it's not a romance. On the Waterfront, anybody? On the Waterfront. Matter of fact, Sylvester Stallone basically boosted his character from the character, you know, Terry Malloy and on the waterfront. So those are, you know, those are some of them. 
Um, but you want to watch classic movies, and if they're really classic by great director, you want to watch them again and again, and, and look at them in different... One time you want to study, look at the movie for the lead actor, sometimes the support actor, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not pulling movies out of the air. I mean, these are all movies that you should watch and study, and it also will help you, you know, when you do conceptually your own movie. Which, which you maybe just trigger something. There are movies that are fantastic, but th th what makes them fantastic exists in that era yes. and not transportable to, right. for example, which romance. I think the romance in How Green with Black Valley. Yes. Oh, it's just exquisite. Yes, yes. But there's an innocence in that dynamic. You can't pull it, well, I don't think right. you can pull it to, 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 to this era. No. And so while I'm sitting here loving it, you it's know, dated. Some of these things... It's another era. Yeah, some, dated, of the, like, some of these uh, things are yeah. dated. My thing is, you know, if the movie is really great, mm -hmm. it transcends time. It becomes a classic. It always works. Um, Hollywood's big on remakes. I'm not. I don't... Some of these things shouldn't be remade. Yeah. Like, they're coming out with The Magnificent Seven. Yep. They shouldn't bother. The Yule Brenner... And that's not even the original. Everybody knows this, right? The, do you know the origins for the Mag Magnificent Seven? How many people have seen it? You guys are gonna need to watch more movies. Right. And with Ewell Brenner. Now, you know what the source for that was. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Seven Samurai. There's a, there's a cinema man. The Seven Samurai from Kurosawa. And uh, Star Wars was also the, the, the hidden forest from Kurosawa. And he said so. I mean, yeah. it's not like George Lucas denied it. He said, I took Kurosawa's movie and put it in space. Sure. Sure. <laughs> they call that an homage. But some of these things shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't be remade. <laughs> like uh, Pelham 1, 2, 3. You can't make it better. No, no, you can make it different, but yeah. you can't make it better. Yeah. So uh, I'm not big on these, uh, on, on the remakes. You know, particularly when they were really, really good and they were classic. Um, yeah. But I love movies. You know, Tarantino has supposedly seen more movies than anyone because he worked in a you know, video store. And he, he claims to have seen 10,000 movies. It's very possible he did. I estimate I've probably seen 5,000 over the past 25 years. Wow. Because I watch four, I'm religiously. I watch sometimes more. Sometimes I watch two in a night. But I watch, I still watch four or five movies uh, a night and have been doing so for 25 years. So I'm sure. What are you watching on Netflix right now? Well, I'm telling you, I'll tell you what I won't watch anymore of is the get down. It's just awful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's painful. It's, it's painful to watch. They said, oh, no, you got to watch it, man. I watched four or five. I said, yeah. no, I'm not yeah. watching it. It's a waste of my life. Yeah. It's just terrible. Yeah. Um, Black Mirror on Netflix is really good. It's a okay. TV show. Really good. It's like the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Very good. Luther, very good. Um, I'm waiting for you to call my, my favorite. Keep going. Uh, oh, man. Let me think. Anything else worth watching? I'll throw it out. Go ahead. I'm totally hooked on Jessica Jones. I haven't seen it. Good? For my, for okay. Well, I'll, listen, I'll give her yeah. I'll give her three episodes. Yeah. They ain't got me in three episodes. And, 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 and that's reasonable. Okay. That's reasonable. I'll give her three you episodes. Know, some people are saying that... So, by the way, I saw... Um, don't tell me. Wait a minute. Um, Daredevil, terrible. Yeah. Unwatchable. And, and and there's a relationship, but it's different. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'm I'm hot to call him Daredevil, but Jessica Jones, I think, it's right. But yes, okay, I'm, I'm going to give it three episodes. That's fair. On your recommendation. Fair enough. I'll okay. take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, interesting casting and... and okay. Casting. I'll watch three of them. Yeah, that's fair. That's more than fair. Um, some people say that we live in an era in which the, it's a golden age of television now. Oh, it is. There's no question. Television now is basically where uh, independent film. Yes. You know, all that independent film created and everything. Yeah. yeah. It just it's, can't, it's in television now. Yeah. And there is some really, really good, inventive, creative, you know, TV that used, like I said, the same uh, creative effort that used to be an independent um, film. For example, Carson, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw a name back and forth. Did you watch Proof? Proof. Uh, Jennifer Bills, Joe Morton. You missed that one. Everybody, who saw Proof? Well, there, wasn't there a stage play? Uh, well, perhaps. This is a common name, but this story is that uh, this, I forget the actor's name, he's a billionaire, and he's, he's, he's terminal in illness, and he no 
is he going to die? So he goes to Jim and Bill. He says, I'll give you all this money. I'll buy a new hospital. But you got to show me that there's definitely life or no life. Is this a movie? It's a TV series. Proof. Proof. Okay. What's it on? It was on either. There you go. What's it on? TNC. Okay. You saw it then, right? You did. Okay. Did you like it? I did. I saw one episode. But it watched all of it. It got better. And so, so the thing is, she's, she has to prove that there's no life after death. Great concept. Mm. And, okay. and Joe Morton is the head of the hospital. And she, okay. she didn't want to have nothing to do with it. She said, this is silly. He said, look, there's money involved. You have to do this. Uh, what's another one? Something that things, uh, humans. Who saw humans? Anybody? Yeah. That one? Yeah. About, about the synthetic people? In, interesting. You see, in sci-fi, it's one of my passions. Oh, really? Oh, my God, yes. Okay. I'm a, tra I'm a Trekkie. Yes. I mean, I oh. go way back. Oh, please. Because, because Trekkie in the house? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. I'm, I'm a... I'm a serious sci-fi nut. Um, yeah, I watch interesting. So, usually, with the sci-fi. In that case, give us give us the, the must-see sci-fi movie. Oh God, what is the best sci-fi? Um, let me think. Toss some names out there. Tell you. Come on, sci-fi. Those Blade are names. Runner. What? Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Blade Runner's up there. Okay. Blade Runner's top five, no first question. Star Trek. What? The first Star Trek. The first what? Star Trek. Perfect. Yeah, but I mean, but that came from TV. I'm, think, I'm thinking of standalone sci-fi. Those are names out. What? Aliens. Who? Doom. Aliens. No, no Doom. Aliens. Eh. First one. Eh. Uh, second one's been out of the world. Some more. Yeah. What was that? Uh, Those Encounters. Oh, uh, the Space Odyssey. The one? The Abyss. Yeah. The Abyss? Uh, no. You're not The Abyss. The Abyss, uh, the Abyss for me was actually uh, a, a romantic movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really thought it, in love stories, that's an unlikely love story. It's okay. It didn't get me. Didn't get you. Didn't, didn't knock me out. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. I, I meant to the moment. Say it out loud. I said he's tough, Warren. I know. <laughs> well, I like what I like. I'm trying to think. Sci fi is tough. Blade Runner's up there. Blade Runner. So, have, so is you your favorite? Have you written one? Are you planning to write a sci-fi piece? Have I written a sci-fi? You know, it's funny you should say that because uh, I should. I'm gonna write. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write sci-fi television. I am gonna uh, write, write a sci-fi spec. I have. I've had this thought in my mind for a long time. Cause see, you know, someone asked me who are your two greatest influences as a writer, and I said Patty Chayefsky wrote, you know, Network and Hospital and Marty and Rod Serling. And I'm, a, I'm a, a Twilight Zone nut. You know, I, you may have been, I did a, uh, my brother and I did a series for HBO called Cosmic Slot, mm. in which George Clinton had the Rod Serling role. Right, right. Anybody saw Cosmic Slot? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. Well, okay. That's more my brother than me, but still. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to write it in TV. I don't have a great sci-fi idea for film. It's tough, you know, it's tough. This movie Passengers is supposed to, see, but I don't believe in it. I don't believe a good sci-fi thing can get through a studio. I just, I don't believe it. But as long as it's a cape, it does. Yeah, well, as long as you have, that's right. A man, they call him man movie. Superman, Aquaman, this man. Oh, did you see Deadpool? Who saw Deadpool? Yeah, that was funny, mildly interesting. That was right. Yeah. Yeah. I liked it because it was kind of genre break. Exactly. And he was good. He had a, a you know, a, a, a certain vibe that was good. It was funny. It's funny. You know, it was, it was funny. good. Didn't take itself too seriously. Because, you know, I'm, I'm sick of these. I, I, listen, I'm a comic book nut, too. Yeah. But I stopped going. And I stopped going to comic book, these comic book movies maybe seven, eight years ago. Because they were all the same thing. I just, I got bored. And they're not, you know. What are you looking forward to, comic book movies? Sully. Sully, is a, you know, everybody know what a trailer is? Yeah. Okay. Sully had the best trailer I've seen in years. Wow. Just watch the trailer. The trailer yeah. will yeah. make you cry. It's very, I said, finally, somebody knows how to make a goddamn trailer because these people make these trailers and it yeah. makes you not want to go to the movie. Yeah. Yeah. But the yeah. Sully trailer is one, it's, it's a tricky thing. One of the things I learned from Jerry. You know, you want to reveal enough of the movie so that you know what it's about, mm -hmm. but you don't want to give the movie away. Creed had a great trailer, too. Who? Creed? Creed. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
trailer. Yeah, the trailer. Yeah, yeah, the trailer was good. Uh, but the Sully, you know, I haven't paid to see a movie in probably four years because I got a home theater. Why bother? And then, you know, they send you movies at the end of the year anyway. So right, right, right. Why, why do I want to bother? I, I'm tempted to almost, but I know they're going to send me Sully. So I'm going to just wait. But yeah, the yeah. trailer was amazing and, emo and deeply emotional. So yeah. it was, yeah. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to that. Um, but not too much because the studios, most of the movies they make are crap. You know, they're just by committee and, you know, it's diffuse and, you know, the era of the uh, swashbuckling filmmaker with, you know, so that, that, that's long gone. <laughs> long, long, it's in TV now. It's in TV, yeah. So, I'm good at, you know, I told you, yes, go ahead. What was it like writing Ali? Ah. Well, I was the original, original writer on Ali, and, uh, you know, for me it was great. Ali was my hero. I, you know, I tell people, I had a very, very close relationship with Ali for 20 years. Ah. And, I, and I tell people that, and I told his wife when I met him, you know, uh, when uh, I was hired, they flew me out with the producer. And his wife was kind of brutal. She said, why didn't he get someone famous <coughs> to write this? And, you know, we and, and over the years, we became so close. She's like my sister. And I always remind her. She said, well, I was being honest. I said, I, I wasn't mad at you. You had every right to say, why didn't they get somebody famous? But they had me. And they, they wanted me because, I, you know, and, um, you know, it was tough for me losing him because, you know, Ali was like a, like an alternate father for me. And, and, told uh, his wife, and she knew this to be true, you know, two greatest influences in my whole life, my mother and Ali. I mean, for black men of my age, there was just Ali. I can't, I can't begin to tell you the, the influence that he had on my life. I just can't begin to tell you. So to be able to meet your idol and then, you know, write a story is one of the greatest experiences of my life. Now, I was fired. Um, not so much fired. I would say the head of the studio was going to make my version of Ali. And the title of my Ali movie was Power and Grace. And then he, Mark Ken, you know Mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark got fired. Tortured first and then fired. And he was a good guy, too. It's too bad what they did to him. And then uh, Amy took over. So it was kind of put on the shelf. Matter of fact, I'll tell you, when I was hired, which was 25 years ago to write it. They didn't even have a piece of talent for it. Their idea of talent when I was hired was, well, write it for Larry Fishburne. Fish was too old then. And uh, when I turned it in, they said, oh, shit, we like this. Who are we going to put in? I said, listen, there's this guy, young guy on television, The Fresh Prince. He'd be a perfect Ali. Now, no one believes this. They think, right. I'm, oh, you're hopping on the wheel switch. Like, no, I swear to God. Yeah, yeah. I swear to my mother. Yeah, yeah. They said, who should we get to play? I said, this kid on TV, yeah. The Fresh Prince. He had his first meeting for Ali 24, 24 years ago. Wow. And he was The Fresh Prince. They, but the thing is this. There's a term you, you know, obviously in Hollywood, they call it financeable. Mm -hmm. He wasn't financeable. Bankable. It wasn't bankable. No one was gonna no one was gonna spend anything on the Fresh Prince doing a movie. But they had a courtesy meeting with him and he was all, oh yeah, I can play that. So 25, well could have been more than 23 or 24 then. And uh, you know, it didn't go anywhere because they didn't have a piece of talent for the script. So it wasn't so much I was like fired, it's like they didn't have anybody. So then they got Barry Levinson. You know, and uh, and by then, Will, you know, after 10 years, it sort of started to blow up. And, you know, he was on it for a while, so he hired a couple of what I consider hacks, Ravel and Wilkinson. And, um, you know, they, they came in and did their version of it, a hack version. And then Wild West came out and tanked, and Will called, very few people know this, Will called the studio and said, you got to drop Barry. <laughs> because Wild West tanked. And he blamed Barry for it. So they dropped him. And so, and you know, we're talking now <coughs> 12, 12 years into the process. And so then it came down to Michael Mann and Spike. Spike wanted to shoot my script. Michael Mann and Eric had written another, you know, their version of it. And uh, it was up to Will to make the decision. Now, Jada had read my script. And Jada tried to get him. She said, let Spike do it. And I read Greg's script, and I love it. And uh, 
Michael Mann at the time was, you know, he was Michael Mann. And so Will felt more comfortable with Michael Mann, even though the script wasn't, you know, there's nothing to speak of. The white man's ice is colder. Yeah, the white man's ice is colder. <laughs> Will's notorious for this, not working with black directors or black writers, he's notorious for it. And so he picked Michael Mann. And what they came up with is a flat movie with no point of view, with no story. And Michael Mann dismissed me by saying, well, what you've written is domestic melodrama. Now, my take on the Ali movie, from, you know, from my script, you know, I ended up with co-writer credit on it, whatever. But the, my take was that it was a father-son story. Because his father, who was a muralist, used to get down there in his cups and say, I could be the greatest. I could be the greatest ever if the white man would give me a commission. That's where Ali got him from. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, Ali, you know, I wrote, Ali had 105 amateur bouts as a, you know, Golden Glover, and his father didn't attend one. Now, Golden Gloves, if you know anything about it, is all about fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. That's all. It's not really about boxing. Mm -hmm. You take your boy to the match, go knock him out. It's, it's all about father-son bonding. Ali had to go to 105 of those matches by himself. Wow. And he had such a hole in his heart that he wanted a daddy. And he left the house looking for daddies. And it explained Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm wow. X. Wow. He wanted to please all these older men. Yeah. Okay? And, and uh, that was my take on it. And Michael Mann said, that's a domestic melodrama. And you know what I said before he fired me? I said, well, what's your take? Mm -hmm. And that was the end of the discussion. He didn't have one. Right. In other words, all he did was just unfold the events in Ali's life. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any point of view. Yeah. And I still defy anyone to come up with a better explanation for Ali mm -hmm. and what made Ali. Sure. And, that, and, that, and that was it, that, that need to please older men. Out of the ring, Ali was so passive. You know, uh, uh, put the bravado aside. I'm talking about the personal Ali. He was sort of passive and kind of meek outside of, outside of the ring. But the best part of the Ali thing, and you know, when the movie screened, I mean, I was there at the screening, and, after, and the movie was flat. It wasn't good. Will's performance was great. I walked to him after. I got to him first, and I said, Champ, I wish the movie was better. You know what he said to me? I'm still Ali. In other words, what he was saying is, I don't give a damn about a movie. Right, right. I'm Ali. Right. I'm bigger than Hollywood. Bigger than a movie, bigger than Hollywood. He didn't care. But I managed to maintain my relationship with Ali, which has been one of the greatest things in my whole life. Maybe the greatest thing that's happened to me my whole life. And I got to travel with him, went to Cuba with him, and met Fidel. Wow. Oh, man, you know, but to get that call from Ali, from, which was five years ago, you know, they had a celebration in Louisville, and his wife entered, uh, asked me to come speak at his 70th birthday. And if you, uh, have any of you heard of the GOAT book, the greatest of all time book, that big uh, coffee table book, anybody? Well, if you go to New York to the Toshin store, you can see the book. The book costs $6,000. It weighs 75 pounds. It's this big. It's like that. I mean, you need a stand for it. So when Toshin, Toshin makes all these coffee table books, oversized. So they, they called me 12 years ago and said, we're doing you know an Ali book called The Goat Book. We want you to write some essays for it. I turned them down at first because the money was really short. I mean, the, if anybody's negotiating with these Germans, they're notoriously cheap. And uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time, who was a little smarter than I was, said, you have to be, be part of history. And I said, boy, that's a, that's a high cost to pay to be part of history. But I'm so glad I did. Because the book turned out, you know, it was amazing, and I got to write four essays for the book. So if you go to the Toshin store in New York, you can see the book. You can even buy a mini goat, which costs $150. If you can get one, they sold out. Uh, which is the same book, but it's only this big, and it costs $150. Wow. The mini goat. So I say that to say there were four essays. So the German, uh, Toshin, called me up and said, Greg, we have good news for you. Uh, we love your uh, essay. Rumble in an urban jungle so much, we're going to make it the introduction of the Goat Book. So if you go and see the Goat Book in New York, and you know there's a bunch of pictures and a bunch of pictures, and the first essay is mine, Rumble in an Urban Jungle. And it's about when I was very young, Rumble in the Jungle, I saw it at Madison Square Garden. And I told them when I pitched the Ali movie, I said that was the 
most exciting things ever happened to me in my entire life. To this day, it's the most exciting thing that's ever happened. When they, when they showed Rumble in the Jungle at Madison Square Garden, and I'm telling you, it was a night like I'll never forget. So I wrote an essay about it. That's the introduction to the uh, Goat Book. On his 70th birthday, see, the Ali is probably, was, excuse me, dyslexic. I don't know that he ever re read a book all the way through. It's highly intelligent. It didn't mean there was lack of intelligence, but uh, dyslexic, you know. So I'm certain he never read any of the essays in the Goat Book. And I, my dream from the time I wrote that essay was I was going to have a chance at some point to read it to him. So on his 70th birthday, I got to, uh, it's on my website, I got, I got to read, it, read him Rumble in an Urban Jungle, which was transformative in my life. People are giving me a hand sign. Yeah, go ahead.